Well, grace and mercy and peace be with you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a phrase that perhaps you are familiar with. It's the phrase, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. If you've never heard that before, it means essentially we think that if we can just get over there, somewhere else than where I am, to that other place, that things will be better. It'll be greener pastures. It'll be so good. But honestly, those of you who have lived long enough to cross over that fence a time or two, and maybe even go back, you realize the reality that the grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence. You know, oftentimes we build things up in our expectations. We build up these hopes and these dreams. We set lofty goals, and there's nothing wrong with this. It's good to do so, But oftentimes what happens is when we get to that reality, we realize maybe it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. Sure, maybe it's better than where I came from. Maybe maybe you set a lofty goal and you achieved it. Maybe you set a dream and you got there. But once you got there, you realize it's still not perfect. This new situation in life still has its frustrations still has its limitations. It's not all it's cracked up to be. Because reality often does not match our expectations. Reality does often not match our expectations. What we expect to happen in life, it might just not pan out in real life. We are in chapter 19 of the story today. Chapter 19 of the story, it's right in the middle of the Bible. The chapter title is The Return Home. Now, some of you are just here for the first time today. You haven't been journeying with us. And even those who have, it's important for me to set the context for you once again, because this is a huge moment in the lives of God's people and for an understanding of the scripture in general. So here's where we are in the story. There's there's a lot that happened before this, but essentially... God's people had been living in the promised land, the land of Israel. Due to their faithlessness and their turning away from God and turning towards other gods and disobeying God's law, God had allowed them to essentially be destroyed. God allowed a a foreign army, the Babylonians, under the direction of King Nebuchadnezzar to come to the city of Jerusalem, the epicenter of of the worship of God's people, and destroy their temple, burn it to the ground, knock down the impressive walls that surrounded the city, burn down the homes, and take the people who lived there and bring them hundreds of miles away into captivity. They were in captivity in Babylon for 70 years, almost an entire generation. Here's a map just to show you uh, how far away this was and the route that they traveled. In the lower left-hand corner is Jerusalem, and on the far right-hand side you see Babylon and where God's people, a lot of them, were. After 70 years of captivity, there was a new king. Actually, a new empire took over. The Persians took over from the Babylonians, and there was a new king, King Cyrus. And King Cyrus said, go home, go home, exiles. So he sent them back home. And he he sent them back home actually with a decree that they should go to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. Quite remarkable. So these returning exiles, they had such a hope, such an excitement. And we should, when we're reading this story as as it's told in the book of Ezra, we too should be excited for them. They get to go home. How awesome. In the first wave, about 42,000 people headed back to Jerusalem. And when they got there, when they got there, well, things had changed. I mean, it's been 70 years. A lot happened. People have moved into Jerusalem. 
Actually, intentionally, the Babylonians had sent other people and moved them into Jerusalem. But what they see is rubble. The, the, the rubble of the temple, it's still there. The rubble of the walls, it's still there. Again, though, you can imagine the great excitement they had while heading home. But did the reality of their excitement match their expectations once they got there? Likely not. But we don't really need to just wonder about what reality was like for God's people. We actually have it recorded for us in the Bible. Pastor Kevin read it in Ezra chapter 3 today. One of the very first things that God's people did uh, two years after their arrival in in town uh, was to rebuild the foundation of the temple. So they rebuilt the foundation of the temple and then they constructed an altar just on that foundation because they were so excited to, ha- to, to restart their central worship life before there was ever walls and a ceiling. And you can imagine, this was a big deal. Priests and their vestments and a huge dedication ceremony here on this concrete slab. The young people who were there, who were born in exile and had only heard about this centralized worship life, were so excited to be here and have this worship that they shouted with great shouts of joy and praise. But there were also old people there, old people older than 70, who had been born in Jerusalem before captivity and had seen the former glory of Solomon's temple. And they knew what that looked like. And returning from exile, this concrete slab and this ramshackle altar, it, it just didn't cut it for them. And so for them, those old people, they actually wept. And Ezra records for us that the, the, the sound of people's cheers and the sound of people's tears were both so loud that they were indistinguishable from one another. The reality of their return just didn't match expectations. Those of you who uh, have been around our church for a while, maybe remember that at the end of last summer, the end of summer 2021, the, the last sermon series that Pastor Kevin and I preached prior to jumping into the story, actually covered this portion of Scripture. We preached through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So if this is sounding familiar, it's because we covered that just a couple of months ago in great detail. We chose at that point intentionally to preach through Ezra and Nehemiah. And we called that sermon series Rubble Restoration. And the reason that we preached through Ezra and Nehemiah at that point in that season was because we felt, we believed that we were turning the corner out of COVID. (laughs) And we were excited about this ministry season that was going to be coming. A lot of exciting things. So in that sermon series, we talked about rebuilding out of the rubble of what COVID caused. Well, as this ministry season has unfolded, things haven't always gone quite according to plans. We talked about our garage build outside, and it still doesn't have siding. It still doesn't have garage doors on it. Here we are. We talked about lots of stuff. We talked about rebuilding, but (laughs) frankly, we've got water systems flooding our church multiple times, and ceilings are falling and causing rubble. We're not rebuilding out of the rubble. And even on top of that, the COVID business is still happening. We're still dealing with it, still living with it. Our expectations were high, but reality oftentimes doesn't match our expectations. You've had these experiences in life where reality didn't match your expectations. When you were dating your fiancé and your fiancé had those little annoyances that you knew were present, and you thought that somehow it would just disappear when you put a ring on the finger... And then you realize that those annoyances are actually part of that person's personality and they're actually just going to grow with them and you're just going to have to figure out how to love that person through it and deal with it. You understand? When you purchased a bigger house, you thought, wow, this is going to be a wonderful experience. We're going to have so much room for our family to grow. 
it's going to be lovely. And then you realize that with a bigger house come bigger problems and bigger uh, expenses and bigger cleaning projects and frankly just more storage room to collect stuff that you don't need. (laughs) You thought that when you took that new job with the pay raise, that you were going to be able to escape all of the relationship mess that you dealt with with your boss and your coworkers. And if not, you thought at least the pay would make up for it. But then you got there, and regardless of how much you got paid, those relationship strains, those people that are just hard to deal with, they are still there. Reality oftentimes does not match our expectations. For the returned exiles, it wasn't just the foundation and the altar that didn't match their expectations, but they had opponents who lived in the land, people who lived there who did not want them to rebuild. And they didn't expect this, the returned exiles didn't expect this, but here they are, and they did everything. They taunted them, They threatened them. They tried to pay people off in order to get them to cease construction on the temple. And actually, it worked. They, for a while, for years, actually stopped building the temple in order just to focus building their own homes instead of building a house for the Lord. Reality did not match their expectations. But you know what? When we read through the Scriptures... Uh, This whole idea of reality not matching expectations is very common. It happens over and over and over again. Think about it in the lower story perspective. That is, in in the way that we see life happening in this world as as we live it out day to day, in our lower story perspective, as I've already demonstrated, oftentimes reality doesn't match our expectations. Oftentimes, the the grass is not always greener on the other side. In our lower story perspective, sometimes our expectations of God and, and what we want of Him and what we expect of Him to do in our lives, oftentimes that reality doesn't match our expectations in our lower story. But in the upper story, that is in the way that God is at work, above all things, carrying out his plan and promise. Reality oftentimes doesn't match expectations. But it's different. It's flipped. It's not that reality comes in less than the expectations. It's that reality comes in greater than our expectations. With God, the grass is always greener. Because God supersedes our expectations. He does things that we would never expect. He creates new realities that we could never imagine or dream up. Just consider our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't match the expectations of the people who were awaiting a Messiah, a new king. He didn't. And yet that's exactly who he is. And not just king over Israel, but king over all things in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Jesus is Lord over it all. And yet Jesus didn't match the expectations of those longing for the king. Jesus didn't look like much. Isaiah describes him as an appearance that wasn't all that much to look at. Jesus didn't come armed with a sword or an army. Jesus didn't come as a politician. Jesus did not come with great might and authority here on earth. Jesus came lowly, humble, homeless. And eventually Jesus died. What kind of king can be king when he's dead? A king who's dead is no longer king. This is what we've seen in the story play out. When a king dies, the next guy just takes over. But Jesus is our king. Why? Because Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. Jesus rose from the dead. Did you see that coming? Did you expect Jesus to rise from the dead? No one did. 
even though he explicitly told them multiple times, I will die and on the third day rise from the dead, his followers were shocked when they saw him alive. They could hardly believe it. Jesus does things far beyond our expectations, in particular, rising from the dead. And right now, Jesus is alive. Right now, Jesus is king. Right now, Jesus is your Lord, and he is with you. But you may think, I don't know about that. I don't know how Jesus is with me right now. When I look at my life, it doesn't seem like much. When I look at my life, I, I don't have things together at all. My life is a mess. It's in shambles. How is Jesus my king? How and why would Jesus decide to be with me in this mess? In our second lesson today, from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, we heard the Apostle Paul say these words. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. These words are true of you as well. We are not much on our own. We do not live up to even our own expectations of ourselves. We know how this goes. We try to set an exercise plan and plan on exercising regularly, but we fall out after two weeks. We say, hey, we're going to keep our house clean, and after two days, the kids have destroyed it. We say, hey, I'm going to eat healthy, and then there's big bowls of candy at the office, and we fall right for it. We know this reality. We are weak and lowly and foolish, despised, nothing kind of people, and yet God has chosen us to be his people. God has chosen us to be his people. Why has he chosen us who are so nothing? Because if we're going to boast in anything, then we can't boast in ourselves. We can't boast in our strength to accomplish our goals. We can't boast in our ability to accomplish our dreams. If we boast, we boast in Jesus Christ and him alone, who is the only one to do something so unexpected as rise from the dead and promise eternal life to every one of us. Let me just take you back for a minute to those exiles in Jerusalem. Again, they had ceased building the temple because of the opposition for years. And that opposition, it's humorous how this works out, because that opposition, uh, they, they wrote a letter to the king of Persia. It's a new king now, years later, a guy named Darius. Because they, the, the, the Jews had said, hey, we have permission to rebuild the temple. But the opposition said, who gave you permission? And they said, King, King Cyrus. And they were like, well, all right. So they write this letter to Darius. And Darius searches the archives of Persia. And lo and behold, what he finds is the decree from King Cyrus, who had said years before, yes, send the Jews back home. Send them home to rebuild their temple. And on top of that, we're going to pay for the reconstruction of that temple in Jerusalem. The Israelites don't have to pay. We're going to pay for it. It's amazing. Who would have expected that? It's the way God works. Now, you may be struggling to see how this reality is playing out in your life right now. I get that. Actually, just in the last week, I had three different conversations with people who are going through really, really hard times in life, and they all said to me, Pastor, I, I just, I don't see how God is at work here. I just, I don't know. I can't really see it. That's certainly our human experience, as I've demonstrated today. Our reality oftentimes doesn't match our expectations. But what I hope you hear is that that is the moment that God is at work. God is at work doing unexpected things in your unexpected moment. 
When you don't see how it's working out, God is working it out. This is the way that he does it. This is the way he does it, and we see it most clearly in Jesus, in who he is and what he has done for us. Jesus offers to you mercy. It means he lets you go. When you deserve to be punished, he says, no, I'll take your punishment. Jesus gives you grace, which means he loves you when you are unlovable, far beyond our expectations. This is what Jesus does. So let me just tell you today, let me boldly declare it into your ears and into your life that Jesus is with you. He does love you. He is working things out in your life. He is king. He's ruling and reigning over all things. And Jesus is going to do the most unexpected thing for you. Something beyond your wildest dreams. Something in your human reality that you could never fathom. He's going to raise you from the dead. On the day that he returns, you will live forever and ever in a glorious, perfected body. Forever and ever in a glorious, perfected new earth. It will be wonderful far beyond your wildest dreams, far beyond anything that you could expect. See, that reality will be exactly as Jesus has promised, but it might not even match your expectations because what you expect cannot even compare with the glory that he's got prepared for you. I look forward to that day with eager anticipation in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.